Man, today's gonna be a great day. Um, I know you guys are ready to celebrate baptism. So we got some around five or six people that are signed up today. But let me just say this, as I always do, if the Lord moves on your heart and you give your life to Christ or your baptism's out of order and today um, you didn't sign up, but today you want to be baptized, um, we, we have everything available to you. We absolutely believe in spontaneous baptisms. But we also believe that um, you may want to leave here semi-dry, so we have shorts and t-shirts and all those things in the hallway waiting on you if you decide to be baptized today. Everybody say spiritual gifts. Spiritual. We're, in a, we're in a kind of a series. Um, I'm going to take about three weeks, four weeks to talk about spiritual gifts, spirit-filled ministry. And last week, we, we, um, we covered a lot of ground from about 30,000 foot. And um, over the next three weeks, we're going to talk about the three different categories that Scripture puts the gifts in. But just to review, a spiritual gift is any ability the Holy Spirit uses to minister through you to others. And um, last week I said this, and just let me remind you and people who are online who are just now joining maybe in this series, <clears throat> there is a list of spiritual gifts in Scripture, and they're located in three different places, and a lot of people take those and they put them together and go, okay, here is the exhaustive list of all the spiritual gifts that are available. I don't think it's an exhaustive list. I just think it's a list of examples, that there are a lot of ways that God can use you and gift you um, to minister to other people. Like, He wants to move through you to love on other people. That's kind of like your spiritual love language, just the way you love on God's house, God's people, and even the people that are, that are in your community. So those three categories of spiritual gifts are known as the serving gifts, the speaking gifts, and the supernatural gifts. So the last week, I'm going to talk about supernatural gifts. And just um, if you've ever been wondering, like, does this church believe in those? Does, does Pastor Ivy believe in the supernatural gifts? Absolutely. I believe in the supernatural gifts. I think they're still here. I don't think that they went away uh, because of some weird transition. And we're going to talk about all of that come around, around week three. The gifts that we're going to talk about today, the serving gifts, if I say serving, are found in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. So you can go there and you can read those. I'm gonna give the gift, the scriptural reference where it's located. I'm gonna kind of give you a brief description of what the gift is. I'm gonna say, hey, here's some questions um, you could ask yourself to see if you possibly have that gift. And then we're gonna talk about the shadow side of that gift. Every gift has a dark side to it. Every gift causes, kind of like causes that person to find themselves in, very, in difficult situations sometimes because they're using the gift. And sometimes it's, it's just because they lack discipleship. Sometimes it's because they're unhealthy. And sometimes it's because they get deceived. And we're all susceptible to all three. So don't, don't feel like, man, I've arrived. I'm solid. I'll never mess up in using God's gift. We all mess up in, in using God's gift. But the first one we'll talk about is hospitality. Everybody say hospitality. Hospitality is in 1 Corinthians 12. It is the ability to entertain guests often in your home. Everyone is welcome and you make everyone feel welcome. You like cooking, creating atmosphere, event planning. You are a gatherer. You like to get people to meet. You actually love to be a matchmaker and get two people to meet and get married and you often take credit for it. How many know who that person is? <laughs> you needed that. I listen a little. But, but you're really good at it. So <clears throat> um, my wife has the gift of hospitality. Um, and I know a bunch of you do too. I don't really have the gift of hospitality. <laughs> and it's um, something you think about when you're married because when you, like I'm, I'm gifted over here, she's gifted over there, you really need to think about it because if you're married and you decide to buy a home, a person with the gift of, of hospitality, they have a lot of questions that don't really fit your questions. They want to know, is it a big kitchen? Do we have two dining rooms? Is it enough space so people can flow? Do we have outdoor entertaining space? And I'm like, babe, we don't need all this space. She says, yes, we do. We're going to have like 100 people over. I'm like, when? Because I need not be there. I just need to know when the schedule is and when not to show up. But we have, we have grown. And honestly, being around her, the gift has kind of gotten on to me a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm not as hospitable as she is. Like five of you can come over. She'd rather have 500 of you over. And I'm, I'm getting better at it. But if you're in a relationship with somebody who has a gift that you don't have, here's the thing you need to learn. You need to figure out how to make your gifts work together. That you can, all my married couples there, that you can literally become one flesh, as the Bible says, so that you can do great and powerful ministry. So how do you know if you, if you have that gift? Um, do you like parties? Who in here likes parties? Lots of people. I, I know most of you should raise, some of you are not raising your hand, and that's false. You actually do like parties, okay? How many of you like, how many of you like to plan events? You like to make, make parties. You don't necessarily like to go, but you want to make parties. How many of you like to be around three or less people? 
You do not have the gift of hospitality at all. I guess it is not your deal. Um, but here's the, uh, here's the shadow of hospitality. You often invite people you shouldn't invite. You, <laughs> you often get in relationship with people you shouldn't get in relationship with. You need, everybody say discernment. A person with a gift of hospitality needs someone in their life with discernment or they need to pray for the gift of discernment so that they can know this is not a good person to invite into my home. It's a good person to go out to dinner with, but not a good person to invite into my home. And there's lots of different reasons for that. And I'm not saying that <clears throat> we should be completely closed off because there are about, there's, in this room, there's three kinds of home. One is a closed home. Everybody, three or less people, raise your hand. You probably have what's known as a closed home. If somebody's, if like, if you're actually inviting people over, it's a big deal. It's six months in advance. You need some time to think about it. You need some time to prepare. You invite maybe two people over in the course of a year. Like your, your home's pretty scheduled. It's dinner time at this time, bedtime is this time. And everything's run so-so. You probably have the gift of administration. We'll get to that in just a second. Everything is in order. And so, you know, your kids come and say, can somebody come over? Well, who's coming over? Who's their parents? What do they do for a living? Where do they go to school? What's their grade? What's their GPA? Like you just asked all the questions. Closed home, okay? Next one, next one is a random home. Random, everybody say random. random. This is the person whose doors are unlocked. There's no real schedule. They don't even know where the kids are. <laughs> like, where's your kids? I don't know, they're out playing somewhere. Well, he's four. Shouldn't you know where they are? They're like, no, I don't, it's no big deal. Like there's no really set dinner time. Kids eat wherever. Closed home people never go to this home. <laughs> Matter of fact, they don't invite you over. If you have friends that have never invited you over to your home, it's probably because you have a random home, they have a closed home and they know it's just gonna cause tension. <laughs> they're, the people, they're the people that let their kids eat everywhere and it just makes you sweat all over. Like put them at the table, okay? <laughs> How many of you in here have a random home? Grace, go ahead, like you know it. I know some people that should be raising their hand. Jessica's like, ah, I said. <laughs> some of you by stage of life just have a random home, you can't help it, right? <clears throat> now, the next one <clears throat> is what's known as open home. Let me say open home. This is a mix of the two. This, is, this would be kind of the balance. You're not closed, you're not random, meaning you run on a schedule. Dinner time is a little bit uh, flexible if need be. Um, there's order to your house, everybody's not random, but you're not so closed off that you don't invite people. The, the place you wanna grow to is you want to become a, an open home because it's very important that we understand as Christ followers, regardless of our gifts, that we learn how to do life together that we invite people over and let them see how we live so that they can be, they can be inspired. Um, the next one is discernment. I'm gonna say discernment. discernment. It's also in 1 Corinthians 12. It's ability to quickly know if something is of God or of the devil, if it's good or if it's bad. Like you are the person that the Holy Spirit just lives in your belly. Like you have what is known as a gut feeling often that you can look at a person and know, oh, they're shady, they're not. They're crooked, they're not. They're not good, they are. And people go, well, you're judging people. No, God gives us the gift of discernment to know oftentimes people's motives. And some people just have that gift. Like you can hear a communicator, you can go somewhere. How many of you ever walk into a room and you just tell it's funky up in there? Like something's not right. Raise your hand if that's you probably have the gift of discernment. So if you're in here, well, how do I know if I have it? If, you, if people ask you about someone they're gonna get in a relationship with, hey, what do you think about this person? Or if you, like, you see somebody with somebody or you see a two or three people and it's very hard for you not to communicate, hey, watch for that person, these two people are okay. That means you have the gift of discernment. And especially if you can go places and you just know it's weird in there, it's the ability, to, what's called to discern the spirits. You know something's not right. Probably have the gift of discernment. Now here's the shadow of the gift of discernment. You can also become critical. You can start to point out all the wrongs and never any of the rights. And in your unhealth, you believe this gift is for you to help other people, but actually this gift is also for you to help you. To know that when you're in the wrong and when maybe your motives are not correct. So it's very important that you stay in health if you're gonna use the, the gift of discernment and know that it's not just for you to pick out what's wrong, it's all for you to celebrate what is right. And this, help those people that you think are off a little bit. 
Don't just stand back and point the finger, but step into the place where you can help people along the journey. The next one is helps. Everybody say helps. This is in Romans 12. It's, it's the ability to joyfully, everybody say joyfully. joyfully. That's the key word. The ability to joyfully work alongside others you like or would rather be behind the scenes. You see a need, you feel it, and you don't have to be in charge. This is a person, how do I know if I have this gift? If you see somebody who, who is doing something and they're not doing it very well, do you look at them and criticize them or do you wanna get in and help them? Like, do you just want to say, hey, that's dumb, don't do that? Or are you a person like, hey, how can I help you? Because if you're the person who points at the person who goes, that's dumb, don't do that, you probably don't have the gift. Okay, there's another gift, we'll get to that next week, but <laughs> you definitely don't have the gift of sometimes called serving or helps. But if you're the kind of person that's like, I don't care what needs to be done, just tell me what needs to be done and I'll do that. I don't even have to, I don't have to run the schedule, I don't have to run a show. I, matter of fact, I'd rather be behind the scenes. Now, Jesus obviously flowed in all the gifts, but Jesus is the one who said, I did not come to be served, but to serve other people. And so he modeled for us what servanthood looked like. Now, the shadow of this gift is people who have the gift of helps need to learn a very powerful word. And that word is what? What do you think it is? No, you need to learn to say no. You can't keep saying yes to everybody because here's what happens to a person with the gift of helps or serving. They keep saying yes and then they start to blame other people for their burnout. Instead of in their health understanding and in their security, hey man, I, can't, I don't have time to do that and keep your priorities in list because if your family needs serving and you're not serving them and you're serving other people, your priorities are out of whack and it's gonna go bad. So if you have this gift, just be aware of that. <clears throat> the next gift is the gift of administration. Everybody say administration. Also in 1 Corinthians 12, you like to give directions, make decisions. Everything, everything, everybody say everything, everything. needs to be in order. You say questions like this, what is better than organization? More organization. Like, let's just make a plan. Let's make a spreadsheet. Let's put some things on a list. Let's make sure that there's order around here. So how do you know if you have the gift of administration? Will you tell everybody what to do? <laughs> like, you just, you just want to say, hey, you should really think. This is your thing. You should think about what you're doing. You should not do it in that order. That order is incorrect. What is the shadow of that? You probably have OCD. That's like, that's unhealthy administration. Every, like everything's gotta be in control. And if you have that gift, that's one of the things you need to watch out for. You can, too be, you can also become critical. You can also lend yourself to OCD because you, va you start to value control and you struggle sometimes to trust God. If you're in a relation, if somebody with a gift of administrations in relationship or work with somebody in leadership, the administrator can often undercut the leader because they believe they think things through more than the leader does. But the leader thinks <laughs> the administrator wants to cut out all the fun and holds me from getting to the top of the hill. Because an administrator doesn't like risk, which can cause you to miss out on things in life. So just know with every gift, everything that you're good at, there's a side of it that kind of can steal things away from you and you need to be as healthy as you can possibly be to flow in these gifts and serve people. The next one is giving. Everybody say giving. This is in Romans 12. Basically, very simply put, you just love to give. You love to give money. You love to give clothes. You love to give stuff. Jesus taught on giving or slash money 25% of the time. He understood the power of giving. God is very giving. He loved the world so much that he gave his only son. It is absolutely a powerful gift. How do you know if you got it? Do you look for places to give? Does it excite you to give? Do you give before you're asked? Do you ask people, do you need something? Um, if, if there's a clothes drive, you go empty your closet. Like you just, you get really excited and you have a lot of joy when you have the opportunity to give. Okay, what's the shadow of it? You too, who has the gift of giving, need to have the gift of discernment. You need to be able to know, is this good soil I should be sowing into? Like this, this decision, smart. And also you need to understand that some people who are unhealthy that have the gift of giving will give themselves broke because they find identity and so much pleasure in that gift that they don't steward where the giving is coming from and they wind up getting themselves into trouble. So you just need to be, everybody say healthy. 
You have to be as healthy as you can be, discipled in a grounded church so that when your gift begins to develop and you know what it is and you start exercising it, that you don't find yourself on the shadow side, but you you find yourself on the heavenly side where you actually do great and powerful things. The next one is faith. Everybody say faith. This is in 1 Corinthians 12. This is the ability to see what needs to be done and trust God to make it happen. Like you have low worry. You just don't worry about. If you, how do you know if you have the gift? You sleep really well. <laughs> you just don't really worry about anything. Your, your, your spouse is like chewing their fingernails off and all stressed out and asking a bunch of questions and you're snoring on the other side of the bed because you don't care. You know God's gonna take care of it. Your favorite statement is God's gonna do it. I believe, I have faith. You, you people come to you when they are, are struggling in hope because they know if they come to you, you're gonna fill them with hope and they can borrow a little bit of your faith. Like it fires you up. You tell stories about God all the time, all that God has done in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, all God's done in your life. You know people that God's done things in their life. You prayed for people, miracles have happened. You are absolutely full of faith. You don't see obstacles. You only see opportunities for God to do something amazing. How many of you are like that? Wait, let me ask you this. How many of you are so positive that nobody really wants to be around you that much? (laughs) Raise your hand. You're like, you're fired up about every day. There's no bad day because this is the day the Lord has made. I will be glad and rejoice in it. God's gonna move today. God's gonna do something. I'm going to Walmart and I'm on mission for the Lord and God's gonna give me a word to say somebody. I'm about to bless that person, pray for that person. That's just how you roll. Who's that in here? There's really not that many. Raise your hand, Nicole, if it's you. (laughs) Go ahead. It's me. Is it you? (laughs) <laughs> She's looking, is it me? I don't know if it's me. <laughs> Who else? Benet, raise your hand. Everybody else in here? Okay, listen, if that's the case, if we, if we struggle as a church to, to find people in our house that have the gift of faith, I wanna ask you to do me a favor. I want you to begin to pray for the gift because you have to have a lot of people around. You don't wanna have a bunch of administrators, uh, a bunch of leaders, a bunch of people who like kind of plan God out of the way. You gotta, you gotta have people that are like, you can believe God for that, he'll do it for you. Let's join together and pray because for two or more gathered, there he is. He said, if two are touching anything, it will happen. Like they, they have the word on the inside of them because they are full of, everybody say faith. Now, what's the, what's the shadow side? They'll often use their gift to be irresponsible. Like, I don't need no job. God gonna show up. The Bible says if you don't, don't work, you don't eat. Get a job. You can't just sit around and hope the Lord shows up. Like you gotta do something. Well, I'm just praying, believe in the Lord. No, like you gotta, you gotta put some feet to the prayers. Uh, sometimes they'll use it to just plain no sin and not do what needs to be done. So there's always a flip side to it. So if you're in here and you have the gift of faith, know that that possibly could be um, something you need to watch out for. Last one we're gonna cover today is mercy. Everybody say mercy. This is a great, great gift found in Romans 12. It is the capacity to feel and express compassion and empathy for others. You help people get through tough times. You often feel what they feel and care deeply for that person. Um, There's a very famous parable called the, the parable of the Good Samaritan, which is why people who have the gift of mercy are often known as Good Samaritans. It's where that phrase comes from. And so this this, uh, guy's riding on a road and he sees somebody who's been beat up in a ditch and he stops and he picks him up, takes him to the hotel, puts him in the hotel, takes care of his bills, makes sure that he gets medical care, um, just really goes out of his way to make sure that this person's okay. The people with the gift of mercy go way out of their way to make sure that people are okay. How many of you in here have the gift of mercy? Like you, just, you hurt with people. You'll sit with people. How many would just sit with somebody? Like you don't have to have the answer, but you'll go to the hospital. Like funerals fire you up because you know you get to be there for people. Uh, listen, I know, the people who laugh don't have the gift of mercy. If I, what, when I just said that, like you go sit with people, funerals fire you up, you went, whatever. You did not have it. Like it, it just came out of you right there. Like you just offended all the people that had mercy. They were like, oh, how could you say such a thing? It's, there, it's, people with mercy are typically pretty sensitive. Who in here is pretty sensitive to your feelings and the feelings of others? You also probably have the gift of discernment, more than likely, because you're in tune to emotion and feeling. Compassion is the number one emotion that is um, described about Jesus. In all of the gospels, his compassion is mentioned the most. 
You see Jesus interact with this Samaritan woman at the well, uh, and he has deep and great compassion on her. The woman caught in adultery that they drag out and they're about to stone. Jesus steps in because he has deep compassion for her. And he, he enters in and he feels what they're feeling and he speaks to them from his heart. So what's the shadow of um, people with a gift of mercy? Sometimes you don't take time to get the whole story. You will side with one person before you hear the other person's story and you start to feel deeply about this side and then you find yourself kind of in this weird place when you find the whole story and you go, oh, what you told me is not exactly true. Um, the next thing is you will hurt so much for the person, like you feel it so much that you, you, you take on their problem. Like you, you, it starts to get you down. Um, you also enable people because you often won't challenge their behavior. You become an enabler. So what that means is you, you hurt for the person, you have so much compassion that you don't really want to challenge the behavior that got them in that situation. And what the, what, now what you become is an enabler for them to continue on, oftentimes in sin. And so that is the unhealth side. But Jesus shows us, because I just gave you two instances where he shows unbelievable compassion to a Samaritan woman who's been married several times, now shacked up with somebody, um, a woman who's actually caught in adultery. He shows compassion for them. But in both instances, he says to them, now go and sin no more. That, that he, he feels for them. He's in their space. He doesn't condemn them. He actually says, I don't condemn you. And where now are the ones who were going to condemn you? Because he, he wrote something in the sand, everybody jet. But he does say to both of them, now that you've experienced mercy, go and sin no more. The people who are getting in the tank today have experienced just that. They experienced mercy and grace. They came to a place where they were at the end of themselves. They knew they were broken. They knew they were messed up. And they cried out to Jesus and Jesus, in his mercy, forgave them. He could do that because of the song that we sang earlier, the communion that we took earlier, because he went to the cross and he bore the sin of the entire world. Not so much that he bore it, but the Bible says that he became sin. Him that knew no sin became sin, and he died. His body was broken. He died. He bled out for the forgiveness of the sin. And then he didn't stop there. He rose again. And, and when these people get in this tank, they're signifying that they have died with Jesus and are now resurrected to brand new life. Now, at this church, we don't believe that this act saves you. They're already saved. But this is an outward sign of what has already taken place on the inside. And it is extremely important. It is not a take it or leave it. Oftentimes, when Ann and I will talk with somebody and they're having some trouble in their life and their marriage in, in some way, and we, get, we start talking to them and they say, yeah, I gave my life to Christ when I was, you know, 20. And we say, when did you get baptized? Oh, when I was seven. And we're like, oh, you didn't get baptized. Baptism comes after salvation. And because you have some things out of order, we believe if you get some things in order, your life is going to be better. It's going to be easier, but it's going to be better. And without fail, almost every single time, when people get things in order, because God is a God of order, their life is better. So these people experience the mercy of God. My question is, is have you? Have you experienced the mercy of God? And then the grace of God. Mercy is you don't get what you deserve. Grace is you get more than you deserve. Well, what do you mean by that? Oh, we're all sinners. And we should have to pay for that sin, which is called death. But God said, I don't want you to pay for that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you mercy. And I'm not going to let that punishment come on you. I'm going to put that punishment on Jesus. And then I'm going to give you a gift. I'm going to show you grace. I'm going to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, you're going to walk in power and authority and identity. And you're going to have the righteousness that my son Jesus had. People get worried because they're like, I don't feel saved today. I messed up. I kind of strayed from the path. That's okay. Why? Because God's full of mercy and grace. And any moment you want to turn back to him, he's just waiting with open arms. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to ask you today, have you experienced the mercy of God? Once you did that, were you baptized? And if the answer is no, then I want to give you the opportunity to experience both. If you're in here and you're like, I need the mercy and the grace of God. It's very, very simple. 
People like me make it complicated. The Bible says if you believe in your heart that God raised Christ from the dead and confess with your mouth that he is Lord, you will receive mercy and grace. You'll be saved. And then God will place his Holy Spirit on you. So if that's you, just do that right where you sit. You don't have to get up. You don't have to stand up. You don't have to do anything. And if you're like, I don't really know what to say. Man, just say what's in your heart. The important thing is, is that you believe that what Christ did was enough and that you, do, you at least confess and say, Jesus, your Lord. If you're in here and you've done that, but you never got baptized after you did that, that's okay. Today could be your day. And we want to celebrate with you. So there's some people who are signed up to be baptized. If you're in here and you're signed up already to be baptized, I want you guys to make your way to wherever you've been instructed to go. Go ahead and stand up and go wherever you're going. The rest of the people in here, if you prayed that prayer with me, or you know you should be baptized today, I want you to raise your hand when I count to three. If you prayed that prayer, if you received mercy today, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand if you received mercy today. Anybody in here at all? Anybody in here knows your baptism's out of order? Hey, I got saved when I was 15 or 20 or two weeks ago, but I've never had baptism after. If that's you, raise your hand wherever you're at. Father, thank you so much for moving today. Thank you for moving on hearts. If you're here today and you raised your hand during that, or even if you didn't, and you want to be baptized, I just want to ask you to go out to my left, because I'm facing the sound booth, be right behind you, out into the hallway, and there'll be some people that'll take care of you. But we're, we're going to stand, and we're going to celebrate these people's life transformation. So, Father, thank you for being here today. Thank you for moving. Thank you for touching us during worship. Now, God, we want to join heaven, and we want to celebrate, just as heaven does, as one person has given, all these five people have given their life to Christ. May we rejoice in a way that honors the price it took for these people to be standing here. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen.